All right, welcome everyone to our virtual roundtable for senior housing officers today. My name is Spencer Giese. I'm a research education specialist at Akua Y, and we are in week eight of virtual roundtables as our way to help uh, professionals from all over the globe get together, talk about what's going on, on their campus, and hopefully use some group think and some shared ideas and processes to help move this entire field forward um, as we plan the future, think about what's next, and have a chance to just genuinely connect. Um, as hopefully you have seen, uh, Akuai continues to provide a number of online resources for you as you're addressing a COVID-19 uh, situations on your campus. Uh, we have our online community that is filled with threads of planning for the future to check out. And we also have a number of YouTube recordings. We actually have all of our virtual roundtables on there. So if you've missed an episode or you'd like to uh, check out a past topic, take a look there. I am joined by four outstanding panelists today that you will hear from shortly. Some of you are already sending them love on the Zoom webinar chat, so that's great. I'm glad we have some, some fans out there of our peeps. They are excellent. Um, I know I've gotten to know them a bit more as we've prepped for this session, and they've got a lot of amazing content for you today. But first of all, let's talk about how these sessions go. A reminder, this is not your traditional webinar. You're not going to be talked at, but we really want you to be part of the conversation and help us form what this next hour together looks like. Um, we have a Q&A tab, question and answer. We would love if you would start to submit your questions, even now, if you have questions that you want to make sure we discuss um, throughout our roundtable today, put those in the Q&A tab. As you do that, if you could put your name, institution, position, just to help us connect. Uh, if you want to put your email in there so we can reach out and connect with you via email, that's great. Submitted questions are visible to the entire group. So, uh, attendees can see them, panelists can see them, and can comment on them. So you may, you as a participant may see a question there that you have an answer to or a comment on, put it in there. Uh, we also have the ability to upvote questions. So if there are topics that you see and you're like, that's what I want to hear, upvote that on the Q&A tab. And as we see those questions rise to the top, we'll make sure that we address them. Um, also, some of you found the chat function, so you can reach out to folks and say hello. Uh, so our chat function really for chatting, our Q&A tab really for getting those questions and comments out there, it would be great. Um, just to make sure that everything's coming across loud and clear, you're seeing our faces on webcam, you're seeing a PowerPoint deck. If you could find the raise hand function and hit that raised hand function for me just to show me that it's all working for you. And I love when we find that raised hand function. So. Thank you so much. I'm going to lower those now. It looks like we've got a lot of folks that are connected, engaged. That's outstanding. Um, as we move forward, um, I do like to try to call on folks that raise their hand and want to add to a topic. Uh, so sometimes we'll have topics. I might say, hey, you know, if you want to raise your hand, if you have some items on your campus to connect with on that. And that may, we may bring you into the conversation, unmute you, and then allow you to speak on microphone to the group and share your perspective. Uh, so be aware of that raised hand function. Try not to accidentally hit it. Or you might accidentally get called on. Um, it's like fifth grade all over again. So now let's talk to our facilitators today. Um, I'm going to have each of our facilitators introduce themselves to you. And then we're looking at what's the past week been like on your campus? Obviously, the past two to three months have been wild. But let's talk about what's the past week been like? Where are you currently at? What are those processes you're working on here and now? And April, we're going to start with you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm April Barnes. I'm at the University of South Carolina. I am the executive director there of University Housing. Um, this went, last week has been hopping. So our governor uh, released or rescinded his stay at home order. And so we have been able to finally invite students back to campus to retrieve their belongings that we've had since before spring break. So we are we have about 70 students left on campus uh, and all the rest are, are starting to come in. Of course, that's with 5% social distancing. It's only 5% of the building coming in, but our move out starts on tomorrow. So we're, we're ex thrilled about that. Um, also on our campus, uh, our president just announced yesterday that we will be opening in the fall. And so we are pretty stoked about that. We're ready to get um, busy on what that means for us and and really put some uh, plans into place for fall opening. Thanks, April. Let's go over to Antonio. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Antonio P. I serve as the Director of Residential Life at the University of Houston. And, <clears throat> and our week is, I'm sure, has been very busy like many of yours. Uh, we have never closed, so we have about uh, 7,100 students in our portfolio, just over 5,000 on our campus proper, uh, and about 1,100 today who still need to remove their belongings uh, from the residence hall. So we are uh, trying every method possible, email, phone call, uh, to get them to come back to campus. Uh, our order lifted here in Texas on the 30th of April, and uh, we picked up our aggressive approach to making sure that those students could uh, come back to campus. But we're, we're walking through budget scenarios right now. We're talking about uh, preparations for the fall um, and doing move out. So move out and, and turning, turning rooms. Excellent, thank you, Antonio. Melinda. Hey everybody, I'm Melinda Carlson. I serve as Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Residence Life and Student Housing at SMU in Dallas, Texas. Uh, similar to what has already been said, and, and I would add to that, we did receive our number uh, this week of cost savings target that we need to look at for fiscal year 21. So a lot of this week, in addition to the move out and, and continued scenario planning, really is digging in and figuring out how will we save this dollar amount that we've been tasked with saving. Thanks, Melinda. And Pete. Good afternoon, everyone. Pete Trenacosti coming to you from my office slash uh, music studio here in my house. Um, none of us are back in the office here in, in the state, great state of Ohio, uh, so we're working remotely. Um, things have been topping. I think that was a great, uh, way, a great descriptor. Ohio University is no exception. Uh, you can just Google and go to Inside Higher Ed and find some of the other fun stuff that I won't uh, give too much editorial comment on, but if you follow that, you see that we've had some activism and some other things. Uh, we're heading into some real austere times, uh, it looks like, at the university. Uh, we are a department that has around 7,000 beds, uh, but right now it does look like our occupancy is trending down, uh, which impacts all areas of, the, of um, the campus. In addition to that, uh, our governor just yesterday, I believe, notified uh, that $110 million will be cut from higher education across the great state of Ohio, and that is retroactive or beginning now for this current fiscal year. So the challenges are stark, um, and in my past week, things have been looking at um, counseling, talking to my staff, preparing for the possibility of cuts, furloughs, layoffs, and things of the like. As an auxiliary, we do not anticipate being exempt from those kind of decisions, despite being what I would consider a very financially viable department um, with a significant reserve to back us up. Uh, just a part of being part of a big university and the fact that just because we're an auxiliary doesn't mean that we get to stand on our own two legs. Uh, so it's been very busy and um, emotional at the same time. Thanks for sharing, Pete. Um, and thank you to all our panels for joining us. Um, I know we've got busy schedules. We are going to keep this as a very fast paced uh, discussion today and we will be done uh, at the end of the hour to honor time commitments that you all have both as attendees and panelists today. Uh, so let's get that conversation flowing. I see a number of questions that have come in the q and I love that you're using the upvote function as we will get uh, on those topics again. As a reminder, please use that Q&A function to submit those questions. And we're going to start with something that Megan Mitchell had put in there because we're already up to 12 upvotes on it. So it must be a good one. Hello, friends. Are you considering single rooms for all students? And are you considering a room to bathroom ratio on student floors? So we're looking at bathroom ratio, bathroom usage, and what are our plans so far? So Megan, I, at SMU, we are looking at single room um, usage, both for a potential in-person class uh, pilot in July, as well as looking at that for the fall um, as one of the scenarios. I would say one of our scenarios, we're looking at singles and only singles across the board. And then another one we are looking at um, would take into account that bathroom ratio and we're looking at three people per unit so three people per individual shower three people per individual um, toilet um, so that's the number that we're using um, that was in collaboration with uh, one of the doctors at our health center um, that thought that would be a good um, a good number for community living um, and did some research for us and recommended that three to one for community baths. So that will be a part of the second scenario that we're working through. 
we don't have any hard and fast uh, plans yet at Ohio University, but <clears throat> we are certainly um, preparing many plans. Uh, definitely the low density seems to be a conversation. And uh, this is just me again. I, I'm, I'm a bit of a question, question and skeptic person. Of, I really just, I'm trying to understand the, the benefits, like even to six feet social distance, like point me to the science, point me to the explanation as to where some of these bathroom counts, everything else gets in there. Um, and because and, again, I think folks are kind of going in that direction and I don't know really where we will get to influence things like off campus housing. Like, are we gonna ask the properties that most of our students live in to also do one per bedroom? I don't think we can do that. Will we ask the bars to change some of their hours? The students can't engage in the ways that maybe they currently do. So I worry a little bit about us jumping right into that. Um, so we're certainly trying to give multiple scenarios. We also know that from a health department perspective and state department, we may be told what to do, but I'm just trying to really, I think that it's important for us as practitioners to help really not necessarily push back because politically sometimes that's not the right approach, but to really ask additional questions and reminders. Like I gave another thing, I said, what will we be doing with all the additional furniture that are in the rooms when, when, we, de when we actually move to singles? How will we make sure that other students aren't coming in there to stay in those spaces? Um, we don't have a huge storage place to put that. I imagine other campuses are in the same boat. Um, there are just a lot more questions with the lower density housing, for me at least, that come up that um, by all means, we very well may be heading that way as one of our scenarios. But at the same token, I think that as practitioners, I would encourage all of us online to really continue to ask those deeper questions. And we probably, I just scratched the surface with a couple. There are many that come into that equation. Mm -hmm. We're, we're in the same boat as, a, as Pete. There are no fast answers yet. There are too many stakeholders who haven't weighed in uh, yet. And we know that there are state officials who uh, have yet to speak up that will probably say something. Uh, and I think the other balancing part of this is uh, kind of going to what Pete was saying is, what are our plans? And then what's, the, the, uh, what's digestible for students and parents, right? Um, uh, given what we decide. If if we go doubles and they don't want doubles and don't think that's safe, what does that do to our occupancy? And we go singles, what does that do to our financial standing uh, as, as departments, um, uh, given our pro formas? So we are, we're working towards those things. Literally after this phone call, after this Zoom, we are going back to that um, and uh, looking at the numbers, looking at it and, and continuing the conversation as I hope, I and mean, then I know everyone else is doing that same thing too. Absolutely. We are also um, considering single rooms. We're, we've shifted the conversation a little bit of that, that to the occupancy and the assignment piece. So how are we going to assign students? Um, can we still go with a self-assignment? And what does that look like? And what are the budgetary implications with that? Uh, but we are, we're going to try to provide as many single rooms as we can while still trying to honor our commitment to um, housing all incoming first year students. Thanks all. Um, I've got David Berland on the line. If David, if you could introduce yourself and then share your question with the group. Hey everybody, uh, David Berland, Director of University Housing at Northern Kentucky University. Um, we're still in the throes of trying to decide what we're going to do as an institution. We have announced that we will make a decision by June 15th. So, you know, we'll know in the next month and a half, I guess. Um, we are trying to figure out how we're going to accommodate students if we end up doing depopulated housing. Um, we actually just put a cap on our assignments today and we're only accepting applications but not giving any further assignments until further notice. So I'm wondering, has anyone else done that? Um, if you are looking at depopulated housing, um, how will you decide who gets to stay and who doesn't? I've already been asked to provide uh, a list of students that are technically local and exempt from housing. So my guess is that's where my campus is headed. And then also, um, if you have enough demand, will you consider signing master leases with uh, local apartment complexes to uh, house everybody that wants housing to stay on or near campus? Hey, David. It's so good to hear from you. Hi. Um, uh, we are, I'm not kidding, so our president announced that we were going to open in the fall and um, by 5 p.m. yesterday, so that happened at noon, I'd already been approached by four different apart apartment complexes around <laughs> our, our area saying, hey, we heard you're, you're looking at singles. You want to chat type thing? Um, again, we will probably, we are committed to, to providing uh, 
housing for all of our first year students, we are definitely looking at kind of that exemption radius. So I think that you're right on par for that to say, hey, um, can you stay home if you are, are in that circle? Um, do you want to stay home? So we've, we've also looked at that to, to reach out to students to, to see what their desires are when you say, hey, are, are you wanting to come to campus? Do you wanna drive an hour? Like that's outside of our normal radius, but, but can we look at that? Um, but we would probably reach out to uh, make sure that all of our first year students had housing. Thanks, April. Yep. Ours is similar. Um, we're taking a similar approach, um, just thinking that if we don't look at a master lease, if we do de-densify, um, getting them back hopefully in the second semester would be really difficult because they would be signing leases with off-campus apartments and I think we just wouldn't be able to bring them back in at that point. Um, we have a two-year live-on requirement which I think exacerbates our um, responsibility to do that. We haven't decided who is it that would go into the master lease spaces um, so that is something that we're still still trying to work through um, but we are working with outside um, companies to see how we can still accommodate everyone just differently than we would have before. Thanks, Melinda. Yeah, thank you, David. A lot of, hey, David. Hey, Trent. Can you in there? Oh, we are surviving. Such place my heart from AKU. I have spent some quality years there. Um, I would say that for us, we're, we're a little bit similar. We are also a first and second year requirement school. Uh, we've had a residency requirement at Ohio University since 1971. We're the oldest in the state. And so it does create some pretty stark questions for us in terms of how we're gonna approach that um, issue of if we're asked to reduce our occupancy, uh, especially if it's in the singles, um, how does that actually present? And so one thing I failed to mention earlier, another thing that I think is important for us as a field is to really look at the, when we, when we ask people questions back um, to push things like theory, uh, you know, for me, like what a grand experiment we're potentially entering into of all single rooms where no students are engaging with one another. If you pay attention to the Aku Hawaii, uh, you know, EBI survey, the number one driver of satisfaction is personal interactions nationally and has been for a long time. So I worry a lot, um, you know, all these retention gains and all these things that we talk about that really make up what we're doing really come into question with some of the stuff that we're doing. Again, they're all health reasons that we need to be pushed and maybe told what to do. But I think it's always, to me, it's, it's one of those things I really want us to be telling our leaders those kind of things so they understand with both eyes open of what we're potentially getting ourselves into. And so for us, like we don't know who those are gonna be. If I had to take a guess and crystal ball it, I would have to lean towards first year students would be a priority. Uh, and would we reach out to other off-campus properties potentially? Yes, um, I, I know they're all struggling right now because um, they see their numbers going down as well. So I think that all those cards are potentially things that we would consider, but um, no, no firm decisions yet. Thanks Pete. All right, and thank you, Dave, for submitting that question. I have Michelle on the line. Michelle, if you could bring up your question for the group. Hi, uh, my name is Michelle Gunkelman, and I'm the Director of Residential Life at Saginaw Valley in Michigan. And I'm wondering, how do you see the RA position or expectations changing in relation to community development, uh, duty responsibilities, roommate conflict mediation, et cetera? We, uh, Michelle, we, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we, um, when COVID started, we utilized a framework of a job description that was created by the folks at University of Vermont. And uh, we didn't want to go in that full direction of creating a new job description, but highlighting some virtual engagement. So we, uh, the same way that you'd be checking in with residents on your floor, we put in some requirements for them to check in with a number of residents virtually each week. Um, we, they had a number of uh, programmatic pieces that they would do uh, with our development model. So we were doing those virtually. Um, sharing resources with other departments on campus, we were still doing that. And so uh, we put in uh, that you had to share a, a campus resource uh, once a week with your residents, highlighting a different area of campus. So some of the things that they were already doing, you just tra we're transitioning those to virtual. Um, the thing that I'm wrapping my head around now is the duty component. We moved to no interactions and only answering emergency calls and doing lockouts with RAs as we got into the more aggressive phase of social distancing. And uh, I, I was sharing with the panelists as before we began, right now I'm considering three phases. 
of social distancing for the fall when we started. You know, they started talking about groups of 50, then we moved down to 10, and then um, we got to the point where we were shutting down all of our common spaces. And so uh, tr maybe scaling that out and modeling it out um, a little more with some more detail as we think about how they do their role and how we do some of those duty components. I'm going to twist the conversation just a little bit um, and kind of talk about the budgetary implications that we are facing as well. And when you do a reduced occupancy uh, and your RMs aren't necessarily spending as much time because they have a lower count of residents, um, we are, we're starting to look at what else they could potentially do and how could they help us um, with with things that, that we might have hired other students for. So can they sit the front desk more often? Um, can they help out in the in the housing office more often? Uh, and, and when you look at that, um, if you had a community of 24 that is going to single occupancy and you're down to 12, like how much time do you need to spend building community in the hall and how much time can we kind of re recoup uh, from that and, and use elsewhere and just being very kind of budget conscientious about um, our students and, and how we can still pay them and how we can still engage them, but can we engage them in different ways? Yeah, for us, we haven't gotten too deep into the weeds on the RA piece yet. Um, again, you know, I think that it depends on where you are in your process and what guidance you've had kind of pushes you. But, you know, I'm sure many folks on the line can relate to sometimes where it's like, I need a plan from you on this thing. When does it do? In four hours. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. Well, we can absolutely um, completely rewrite our living guide for students in four hours. We'll go ahead and get right on that. Um, you know, that's just a reality of COVID and some of the things are so fast moving. So I think that we will be looking, I think my, what I'll te uh, task my res life team to do is to basically start with the housing um, community guide and the RA um, expectations and basically start changing the lens and paradigm they view that from as COVID and social distancing and what kind of things that we need to potentially change uh, in order to uh, meet the standards that we need to meet. And I, I think for me, the only thing that I would add to, to what has been said is that we've engaged the RAs in that conversation. Um, we pulled a group of student leaders together and they're talking about just that. How do you build effective community and affinity for an institution when you have to remain socially distant? And so, um, some of those community engagement responsibilities, we've, we've tried to loop the RAs into that conversation. Um, I would be curious if anyone has had RAs approach them about not, no longer wanting to be an RA because of how they are anticipating um, this might, might be for them and they're just not comfortable. I don't know if anyone has had that happen, but curious about that. We um, just had one today with, again, the president's announcement. Um, they said in the president's announcement, he said that we are not going to um, uh, force students to come back or faculty and staff. So they have the option to kind of staying online and, and whatnot. And we had one approach and say, hey, uh, what does that do to my RM position? Because I'd like to stay home type thing. So uh, we, we, we allowed uh, when we got into the thick of COVID RAs to resign uh, without penalty for the upcoming year. And all of them signed back up for the next year, uh, which was encouraging. Uh, we've had to make some difficult decisions to take some of those offers and put them on alternate lists since we've done that uh, because of um, what we're projecting as our occupancy. But right now, many of them are, are looking to come back to campus. And given our population, you know, for some of our students, if they're not getting housing, that may mean they're not necessarily coming back to the institution because uh, it's a big financial aid assistance to them. So right now the numbers are positive and we've got a, a big uh, wait list. Um, so we'll see how we continue to fold out once we do some more of the uh, work, as Pete talked about, the community living guide and the expectations. Thanks all. Um, Larry Shapir, I saw you had your hand raised, so I did, you are able to talk if you want to chime in or if it was an accidental raised hand, oops. Um, but I do have you on speaker if you'd like to jump in. All right, I'm going to move to Sarah Strabel next. Sarah, you had a great question in chat, um, and I'd invite you to introduce yourself and share with the group. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah Strabel from the University of Pikeville in Eastern Kentucky, I'm the Director of Residence Life here. 
Uh, my question is for the panelists, just to kind of gauge um, what you or your institution has learned from this process uh, and how you would apply that if we were to have a second wave of the coronavirus in uh, the upcoming academic year. We were fortunate at Ohio University to shut down. Um, our governor came right out of the gate and said, we're doing a lot of things. You know, he shut down schools. He started moving the higher ed food soon after that. So we, um, we quickly had to put a plan together to get students out. So we are not in a situation where we have a lot of belongings in because um, we were able to use, uh, we used Adirondack, the housing director, and I pushed my biz ops team who were jumped into action, helped very quickly to come up with how can we spread out student checkouts? We normally couldn't do that because it's final exam week, but in this scenario, we wanted to create social distancing and we were doing it beforehand. So one thing I definitely would repeat would be we created um, banks of times. We, we assigned students a time to their parents and emailed them in batch order so they knew when they were to come to campus to do their checkout. But then the system itself allowed them to switch on the fly through the app. And so it reduced the number of calls. It allowed things to flow very smoothly. Uh, our city was so impressed that they actually asked several of us to help educate our off-campus partners on how to do a, a checkout in a pandemic. So it was just, it was so smooth. That part I would definitely do more of. The one thing I wish we had really thought about is, you know, which we'll have to think about is quarantine buildings and how will we work with students and, and what are the things that work best to kind of mitigate that if a second wave comes, I think that'll be essential. And we didn't have to do that because before we had a single case, we were already sending students home. We had a positive case on campus um, in the spring and it was after most of our students had vacated, but we still had about 300 students left on campus. Uh, we ended up um, kind of quarantining the whole building. There were about 17 students in the building. And so we learned a lot from that. We were able to do meal delivery, um, kind of student expectations and what does that what does that mean? How do you communicate with a student who is in quarantine and how do you make sure that they understand what that means? We had a lot of students who were not complying uh, and so kind of getting our Dean of Students involved, um, making sure kind of the police were involved and aware and, and different things. So how do you educate your, your campus? Um, we actually uh, are going to most likely take a building off of offline uh, as we enter the fall semester for a quarantine um, and isolation space. And so figuring out the details of, hey, do you move um, your COVID positive cases in? Uh, if you have um, done any kind of contact tracing, it, it balloons quite quickly. And so who would go in and who would not and, and what, what services do you provide? And so we are working through that as a campus um, and are getting all kind of the partners in place so that we know exactly kind of what what happens and and what is the the turnover of that like how long do you have to stay in um our student health contacts are our students in isolation and quarantine every day to see how they're doing see how they're feeling we deliver meals um that was a bit interesting as as hey our dining um partner would only deliver them so far and then we would have to take over and deliver them the rest of the way and, and different things like that. So there's a lot of things to consider when you're considering um, isolation and quarantine spaces. Yeah, we, we, there's a lot of lessons learned and lessons still to be learned in this. Um, we learned, uh, I think, uh, decision making at the university level is not coming as fast as many of us would like, but that's also dependent upon how many stakeholders are influencing what we're doing, city, state, you know, higher education coordinating committee. We, we are, uh, Melinda and I are in the state of Texas. You all know we were one of the first to open back up. Um, and so uh, thinking about uh, government influence on some of those decisions, needing to be highly uh, collaborative and communicating often and quickly with partners is something that we've had to do uh, in this process. Just when decisions are made, that then we need to move very quickly to do some implementation i.e. when we had quarantine students on campus, we had five uh, quarantine students. And then uh, when study abroad came back, we had to move very quickly to adjust with those. And then now we've got some international students uh, who are going to be with us for the summer coming from various places. So needing to make some considerations for that. So thinking about how decisions are made and how quickly you and your team need to move is something to take into account in your planning uh, as well. And I think uh, now how to scale some of the small things. We did delivery for meals 
for five students? What does that look like when we've got 60 plus and dining options become even more limited, right? So um, I think those are some of the things that we're, we're thinking about. Yeah, I, um, probably one of the things that I would add to, to what has already been said, and, and just, you know, any crisis oftentimes amplifies places where you have challenge, right? Where you can find, you see areas maybe within your organization where you need to spend a little bit more attention. And so I think um, as a fairly, so I'm fairly new to my role. I have the three directors in our department, two are also fairly new to their role. So I think we saw some challenges around role clarity that this has given us the opportunity to re-examine. So I think that's something we've been able to, to look at. And um, another area, so we, once the decision was made to go to online instruction, um, we did not stay open, but we had students let us know if they needed continued housing for whatever reason, right? And that was a lot of international students. Um, but I was, and, and I should not have been, but I was surprised by the number of students who needed to stay on campus because they had no other home, because their home wasn't one that would support remote learning. Um, you know, whether it's a, a financial burden and they just their internet couldn't do it, or there was no quiet space for them at home. And so I think that this um, crisis has really shined a spotlight on access issues and some of our students who are the least resourced. Um, and, and I think that has caused, at least I know me as a professional, to look at some things a little bit differently with that lens. And I know those are kind of 30,000 foot view types of, of concerns or learning that I think we've happened, but, but that has been powerful for me as a professional to see that. Great, and I, I had seen, Alan, I saw that you had your hand up, so you were on yeah. hand. Uh, hi everyone, this is Alan Hargrave at Ball State. And April, I had a question. You said that you were taking a uh, building offline for isolation or quarantine. I had proposed that um, with two problems. One is our environmental health and safety will not allow us to do that with community restrooms and showers. I said cross-contamination, can't do it. Which leaves me university apartments, a small number. So what we're looking at is if you have an available place to go, you have to go home. Yes. And for those students who have no place, as Melinda was talking about, then we will provide more isolated kind of or quarantine housing. I don't think we can reach the level of isolation. But the second piece to that is, I don't know if I can get any staff to go in there. If I could have a building, I couldn't get staff to go in. It, it like would when, kind of when the leave started, I out of it, almost 90 custodians, I had 15 show up to work the next day. Yeah. Um, yes, and I, I think that that absolutely, um, and I don't know that this is luckily, but we had a staff member quarantined in the building because of all the interaction that had, had been happening in the building. And so he was actually the one who delivered meals. Um, the president gave him a presidential coin afterwards because he really did a lot of work. He volunteered to do the fire panel. If the fire alarm went out, we had to write a procedure for fire alarms if they happened um, in that building. Uh, to kind of say, okay, the isolated students go this direction, quarantined go this direction, this is the order that we're going to re-enter the building. Um, there were a lot of things, uh, custodial and facilities um, were one. I, I spent a whole weekend on how do I get this building cleaned, how can I get the common spaces kind of decontaminated, um, what does that look like? We don't have the resources on campus. Luckily for that, we actually do now have some of the resources and that was one of the emergency, well, the future planning groups that I'm on is facilities and, and how do we address cleaning of those um, buildings? How do we get people fitted for um, masks, N95 masks? Like what does that look like? Uh, so that we have the proper PPE as we go into spaces that, that might need cleaning. Um, and so, uh, Definitely, can absolutely with you on all the fears. I think that we've started to address them and say, "Hey, we're we're very concerned about your your safety. We wouldn't ask you to do this. Um, we're actually asking for volunteers for people who would go in and clean spaces um, in the quarantine building and and things like that." And so, 
Um, I think it's having that, that bigger conversation and looking kind of university wide. Um, and then again, our first building, we had to contract out to get clean because we weren't prepared for it. And then- Does the building have community restrooms and showers, April? Or no, is it... no, our, the, the, so, thank you for re-asking okay. that. No, we are, we are actually taking an apartment building offline. And so okay. it, it's a, it's an older style. Um, we fortunately have uh, it in stock. Um, the rooms are a little bit smaller, so we, we do single occupancy, although it's, it's supposed to be double occupancy. And so it'd be two people sharing um, a bathroom. Um, but we're hoping that, that we're actually just going to put single people in apartments until um, we're full. There's about um, uh, 97 single spaces, but it typically the building will will hold up to 345 students. So we're, we're taking a rather large building offline. But it's one of the things that our health um, department, our health services said, we need this in order to open. And so I said, you know what, if, if that's what is needed to open and we will get some revenue versus none, we will we will take a building offline. Thank you. Yeah. To that question, I think, you know, one of the things that I, I found interesting in this experience that I failed to mention before was that we had a student in particular that we said, hey, just let us know when you're gonna be checking out. The student said, well, I don't think I should be checking out. I, I talked to somebody on the phone and they told me I have COVID and I should just be, go ahead and self quarantine had never talked to anybody, was already in the self-quarantine process in their space, who knows who they're interacting with, but we're not gonna get a test by anybody. So I think one thing we need to be ready for is the fact of like, I hope that we have widespread testing available by fall, but the reality of young people getting a test is very unlikely. And we have to deal with not just those that are confirmed, but those that are suspected when we're talking about quarantine. Our health director went as far as saying he was comfortable with us having folks together that were sick, uh, in particular that had COVID, and then healthy students being kept together as well and did not really have any restrictions, at least in the spring. Now that obviously will change as we get into this, but we are all mostly community uh, loaded with about maybe a fifth of suites, uh, but we have no apartments whatsoever. So it'll be intriguing to see how it goes. Um, we're also looking, and I think that the testing piece kind of comes into play as well. Um, our health department is looking at potentially testing people for antibodies by, before they come to campus. I know that we're not quite there um, as a nation, but, but looking to say, hey, what can we kind of be proactive about? Um, I know that it doesn't necessarily slow the spread, but if I can say, hey, on this floor, 14 people have the antibodies necessary and, and we don't have to necessarily worry about them versus the rest of the population. Um, so we're looking at ways we can try to be proactive as we bring students back as well. Um, I've got Harold Fields on the line. Harold had a couple of great questions in chat that I'd love to have him bring up to the group. Sure. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. So again, I'm Harold Fields. I'm the director of the Center for Residence Life at RIT in Rochester, New York. Um, and actually one of my questions we were just discussing a moment ago, I have some questions about quarantine in the spring. Uh, we had about uh, three dozen students at any given time that we were supporting through isolation and quarantine. Um, we were fortunate uh, that not all of them were positive, but we did need to take precautions for folks who were exposed. Um, I know we were just discussing what folks were doing in terms of holding spaces for quarantine and isolation. And I'm also curious if any of your campuses have started to think about a 14-day uh, self-quarantine as students arrive from other states or other locations where there might be more community transmission still active. We had we had a couple of those um, <clears throat> earlier, you know, in Texas and Melinda, I'm interested to see what you all did too. Um, Texas implemented if you came from Louisiana that you you needed to self quarantine. And so uh, we've got the universe, there's a university documentation process where they are, uh, we're asking people to self report to the university that they are self quarantining. And um, we uh, we had our desk, um, well, our, our leadership team met daily. We had a 10 o'clock call every day to, to discuss all of the folks who were self-quarantining um, or we had them in quarantine. Um, and a part of that, we did the meal delivery and we also had the desk to call them to check in to see how they were doing, if symptoms were worsening, changing, they needed different attention, right? That, that whole uh, proof of life uh, check that we had with them. So that, that worked um, on a small scale, again, thinking about what happens if we need to do that much larger than we did. I, I presume some of the tactics we, I just talked about, we would continue. Um, 
but how to move around if that became uh, so many residents on a floor in a community and what, what are the health precautions that we may need to take there uh, in moving folks around are some of the things that I'm thinking about too. Yeah, so Harold, um, we, in terms of the 14 day um, quarantine, so our state had several, um, several places where that was the case. Um, most of them have been lifted, which, you know, I'll try not to show my hand too much, but lifted if you're traveling by car, but still apply if you're flying. Um, so that's, that's a fun thing to manage, but um, we do not anticipate that we'll be um, requiring that in the fall because we hope that we'll be able to have other measures in place, um, such as, you know, antibody testing, temperature taking, um, reporting around, you know, when this all first happened, there was a series of questions that our health center utilized for students that had traveled internationally to try and assess their risk. Um, they're looking at how might those be shifted to be a series of intake questions for our domestic students. Um, and so our potential quarantine um, or isolation when folks arrive will likely be based more on that than by where they're coming from um, is, is where we're leaning in terms of the fall. Great. Um, I have, Jeff Bondi, I saw that you had um, raised your hand. So if you're out there. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, great. My question would be, and maybe Antonio or Melinda, and thank you everybody for, for putting this on. When you say the students had to quarantine for 14 days, did you allow them to quarantine their traditional residence hall space with the shared community bathrooms, or was that in your identified quarantine space, your separate space? So for us, we, we ended up not having to use it, but it was a separate space. We uh, worked with a contractor to set up um, 15 standalone uh, trailers, I guess, um, for the, that are the equivalent of about a 600 square foot apartment um, that we had at the ready. Um, we, we decreased those. Right now we have five on campus and then we'll be ramping up again for fall. Um, we um, only had to have one person isolate in those, and that was a nurse from our health center. Um, but had a student, had we um, been required to isolate a student, they would have utilized those as well. So not, not in the residence hall. For the fall, we are looking at, um, we're actually working with a hotel um, to see if we could master lease a floor for that purpose in the fall. Uh, we had uh, one student who was in a community style bathroom and we moved them into a, a single apartment uh, by themselves. Uh, and then we had a student who was in an apartment with a roommate and then we moved the roommate out of the space uh, to another space within uh, the building for the, for the quarantine purpose. Thanks all. Um, a couple of things. For our attendees, I just want to make sure that um, we all don't know we're recording this. So if you have colleagues that um, were unable to join today, I think we've had a lot of great content. So that will be, I'll be recording out there. Um, a piece of information I'd really like to share with the group, uh, uh, an association that KUI partners with, ACHA, the American College Health Association, uh, just this afternoon, they released their return to campus guidelines. Um, and our future of housing work group is collaborating with them on this. So um, that is going to be a really helpful tool to check out. Again, that is the ACHA return to campus guidelines. Um, I'm sure I have a pretty good feeling we're gonna be putting that on our COVID-19 resource page as well, uh, but that just came out this afternoon. So helpful tidbit there. Um, as I look through our questions and we've had questions of plenty and I, I will recognize right now that it's really difficult to get through them all, but we're trying, I'm doing my darndest to make sure that we touch on the high points and the topics there. Um, so let's see, we've had a lot of, I've got a lot of upvotes on the consideration of facilitating move-in. Uh, so it's hard, we're early, but what do we have right now in our, in our minds in terms of facilitating student move-in? I could start. Um, we are not, we, we're just getting our committee together um, to kind of discuss this possibility and how we go. But <clears throat> we are considering things. I feel like 
for those that are fans of Stranger Things, I feel like this is the upside down. Like when we gave summer assignments, for instance, I said, think about what we would fire an RA for doing and do that. We taped the key to a, to a to half sheet of paper with some rules, slid it under their doors, and that's how they got their key for their next assignment. So we're trying to think about things that are outside the box like that. So one thing we thought of, which also is something we would normally not do, is will we potentially mail the key to students? Um, even though we're still physical keys and there's some risk in that, we might certify the mail, send that there to reduce that traffic of when they might come in. We're also talking about the possibility of extending move-in from what we had been for years, collapsing it down because it was like this process that went on forever. We're going to have to go back to it being forever with social distancing. So we're anticipating at least a week and looking at that, again, the module we talked about for Adirondack, perhaps employing that again um, in such a way that would enable us to let families and students set up their uh, time to arrive to campus. So whether it's de-densified or it's full on, um, I think those are some considerations for us for sure. We've already started having those conversations on our campus, um, and especially now that we are go for fall. Um, sorority recruitment, we have to talk with our partners over there. Um, they are extending their sorority recruitment so that they can have smaller parties and, and different things like that. So we obviously have to extend our move-in. Um, when you look at social distancing um, for move out, our move out process, we're looking at 5%. Um, it takes about 15 days to get our largest halls emptied. Uh, and that won't work for move-in. So what are the percentages? What are the numbers? Um, we started out at about an eight-day move-in, and we think we can do it in a safe, secure um, manner for everyone in about six. So we're, look at, we're looking at also extending that. Um, but we're, it'll, be, it'll look completely, I, I love the upside down reference. Like it, it will look like that. Um, you're used to having large groups of, of students and staff and faculty coming back to volunteer for movement. We're not gonna be able to do any of that. We're not gonna be able to meet them at their cars and pack up their things and load them in. Um, it will be very um, uh, much kind of just a complete reversal of, of what it, it typically has been for us. Yeah, we've made some early decisions. Uh, our move-in committee got kicked off uh, maybe a week or so ago, um, but we are going to have a longer move-in process. We had about four days. We're going to 10 now. We moved our RA training up uh, a week, and so they're coming back at the beginning of August. Everything that they'll be have will be virtual in case we need uh, them to utilize them in a different capacity uh, during this process, too. So, uh, and then the, the last piece is that we need them to do some social distancing training. We've got that time. But it's it's not going to be the friendly customer service Super Bowl that I always say in housing. Housing, our move-in is Super Bowl. It's the time we get to wow. It's really going to be, um, and I hate to use this phrase, but you're on your own. Um, and it's really what we're, we're going to have. So we're asking folks to bring their own materials to help them to move in. We're asking them to consider not bringing as much items to campus as they would have, right? Like the futon, the 65 inch TV, um, you know, because we do need to consider what happens if a second wave comes back. And we're, we're talking about being the same place we were in the spring. Um, uh, and then again, at our desk, um, these, we had a centralized move in. We're going to move it out back into the communities. I'm sure that's something some of you have already been doing. Um, but we talked about guards, uh, clear plexiglass guards at our, at our desk, um, removing as much touch action, maybe setting up a station of things that a person can pick up themselves and go, maybe not even providing carts to the level that we've been doing so beforehand. Um, so really much, how can we set the expectation that you need to move yourself in? Um, I, I think we got into a granular level of talking about elevators uh, in one of our calls of one family per elevator, right? And managing that, something I did when we did when we were at Michigan State too as well. So those are some of the things we're talking about. For us, very, very similar, um, even looking at uh, traffic flow of people, right? I think we do such a good job with moving and looking at literal traffic traffic flow, but we are in some of our buildings looking at one-way hallways, um, trying to figure out how we can avoid so many folks passing each other and, and not being socially distant. And then um, we actually have one staff member who um, is trying to do something around essentialism, think kind of um, Marie Kondo for residence halls, right? Where you hold it and it does not bring you joy, leave it at home. 
Um, so trying to think of ways we can maybe do some fun social media things to get students to bring less items to still make it fun and inviting while and it's not going to be the Super Bowl like Antonio talked about. I saw this other piece. It, it is going to be a sign up. Um, we found when we assigned times before it didn't work well. So allowing folks to opt in, but limiting it to 20 or 25 people per hour, um, being able to move in. Uh, our sign up to move out slides didn't go as well, but we figured it out with Mercury how to do it much better for the fall. So we're going to move that direction. A couple tidbits I've I've heard in terms of just office setups as we talk about what that move-in looks like. I've heard a lot of the plexiglass that Antonio talked about. I've heard some institutions pricing out infrared scanners to the openings of residence halls. I don't want to know that cost, but uh, that that's a thought. Um, I did bring up that I think in my work with college students on campus in the past, I feel like they got sick with a lot of things that might have elevated the temperature, but you know, um, and then uh, the, the cutaway doors, like the double doors, I call them the misread doors, where you've got the bottom there for maybe doors to residence hall director offices, administrative offices, so your students don't come all the way in, but they can see you, they can interact with you, but there is that physical stopper. Um, I know we are getting close to the end of our time, so we're going to move into closing our parting thoughts with our panelists, but before we get there, I've got a couple items I want to share. I'll throw it back to them. Um, we senior housing officers thanks for joining us please check your inbox you should be seeing an invitation to straw poll number five um, that has been sent out to our shos uh, and this straw poll was initiated by our QOI future of housing work group um, so please participate if you're able to um, that task force has been or has been doing so much uh, to really come together pool resources and you know we have so much output that we hope to share with you from that group soon. Um, we have two more roundtables coming up that I can share with you. We have a coffee break tomorrow afternoon at 2 p.m. So if you'd like to just chat and there's maybe no topic and it can be lower stress and sip on a beverage of your choice, join us for our coffee break at two o'clock Eastern tomorrow afternoon. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to be having an academic initiatives based group uh, so we'll talk about some learning communities. I'm sure we'll talk about some residential curriculum. I saw a few questions related to that in our Q&A. So that would be a great session to go to. Um, and then we're also, we have a session on human resources that's in the hopper that when we have that solidified time and date, we will share that with the group. But those are some things to look forward to. Um, those are my parting thoughts. So I'm gonna throw it to our co-facilitators as we wrap up today. Sure, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. This is this has been good. It's been good to work with all of the, the co-facilitators. Um, for me, I think that a parting thought and, and a headspace that I've tried to continue to be in um, when oftentimes we are making those choices that seem to rub up against each other between um, social distancing, de-densifying, and what that means financially and what that does to the to the budget, right? And, and the business decisions. And I keep trying to tell myself and 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 also the, the folks that will listen, right, that, that, are, um, that I report to and, and higher up that, that really planning for a healthy campus is the best business decision that we can make through all of this. And so trying to remember that at the forefront of all of the plans, um, I think it has been critical, particularly in a state, and, and Antonio has, um, has talked about this, where we seem to be really ripping the Band-Aid off quickly, um, making us have to make some different decisions. So, so remembering that, that a healthy campus community is a good business decision. I just want to thank everyone too. I thank Kuhawai for the invitation to do this. It's been a lot of fun and thank everyone for being on the call. Uh, my parting thoughts would say that, um, you know, one of the things that I think we're, we're pretty good at as professionals is working within the ambigu ambiguous, um, the difficult and the unprecedented. And this is certainly something that has really pressed us all in the service. Uh, while none of this is a deal, ideal, uh, it's something we're going to need to work through. And while I would say that we're not health experts and we need to rely upon those folks, we do need to remember as a profession that we are housing and residence life experts. And so I think that there's a lot of folks that are unfortunately viewing our work as a number on a page or as we're going to do this thing and then there's going to be this outcome. When you change all the things that we're doing, there are going to be potentially differential outcomes and preparing senior leadership to understand that I think is part of the role that we can play uh, both on our campuses and as a profession. Yeah. I think that that's really important, telling our story and making sure that, that they 
see the ripple effect of the decisions that are being made and what happens, you know, four ripples later of, hey, remember when we made this decision, this is going to be the impact on that. So definitely uh, communicating with your, your campus partners and, and again, in that telling your story, making sure they, they see the bigger picture. We were just contacted about potentially moving out all of our soft furniture um, in the residence halls and, and that has huge impacts on not only our turn schedule of, hey, we're trying to get buildings cleaned for the fall, but hey, where do we keep that? Who's paying for that? How is it getting moved out? And so being able to kind of tell your story with that, but working with them so that that um, you're finding a solution together. I think that that, that helps. Um, and also uh, reaching out to your colleagues. Thank you so much. This has been so fun uh, to work with our panelists. And and I think Akuho I, uh, I have people who check in on me and they, they tell me funny stories and they tell me um, really insightful things that are happening at their campus that, that help mine. So reach out to your colleagues and make sure that um, we're not only taking care of each other, but helping each other. And I too want to add my thanks to Spencer and Akul. I, this, these forums, these spaces have been really helpful in trying to think through some of these uh, pieces. I too would add to lean on your community. I have a, there's a group of directors who I'm in constant contact with every day. Literally, we're sitting in a meeting and we're talking about an idea. Who's doing this? Who's got what resource? That's really, really helped. Something for yourself that I keep doing for me is to eat something positive and happy every day. And that does not necessarily mean a food, but we are literally wrapping our heads around saving jobs, trying to think about how we're planning all day, every day. We're, we're not, some of us are not sleeping well because of the decisions that we know we have to make and things that we know. And so doing something for yourself that's going to keep you happy during this time. And the last piece is to bring your team along. We right now in some ways are um, insulating ourselves with the people who are making these decisions, but not to forget their team members who want to learn as we are making some of these tough decisions and that we don't have to shield all of them from, from every piece. We may not disclose everything that's happening. Some, th some things are saved for when you sit in the seat because they're just literally that heavy. But to try to bring folks along as we, um, as we make these tough decisions. So thanks again. Thank you all for sharing. Co-facilitators, outstanding to have this call with you all today. Our participants, thanks for spending an hour with us. Uh, we will continue to have these. Um, feel free to reach out. Last thing I'll say, I did post the link to that ACHA document in the chat. We are going to end the session, but if you want to grab that link before you go, please do. Um, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. We'll see you back online soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.